Welcome back to Keep Idaho Red Radio. Tom, we've uh, started the morning with some great legislators, one yes. on the Senate talking about some education issues, and then we talked to Barbara Ehart, who's talking about ESG and her her work with uh, the Fairness in Women's Sports Act. And the education so, piece, we were talking about property taxes, yeah, which we're always talking always about. Always talking right? about yeah. that. And a lot of people like to talk about election integrity right. and elections, and so we thought, why not, right after the election, let's bring in some two experts from the state, and we'll talk about some trends that happen. We'll talk about legislative D- district 26. Remember yes, we had Jack yeah. Nelson on last yeah. week to talk about that race and maybe just talk a little bit about this uh, audit that they all have to do now, leg- the legislature. And what, what did they learn? Yeah. So we'll talk about some, uh, we'll talk about those three topics. So Perfect. to help us with that, we're going to have Chad Hauk, who's the chief deputy secretary of state currently, and Jason Hancock, who's the deputy secretary of state. So welcome to you both. Welcome to Keep Idaho Red Radio. Thank you. So let's start real simple. Um, maybe you start with Jason. Jason, talk about the basics of uh, of the election. What what basic trends? What were the basic facts? What were the what observations? Was, what was surprising? What were your observations? Yeah. yeah. You know, I think we were a little bit surprised that uh, turnout was on the low side. We were expecting it to be higher than this, just uh, given kind of, you know, national enthusiasm for for different things. But I think, you know, what we learned is that, uh, you know, when you have a a general election and when you have the, you know, kind of the minority party in Idaho, the Democratic Party, not really putting much money or effort into their top of the ticket races – it, it tends not to generate as much enthusiasm. You know, four years ago, you had Paulette Jordan at the top of the ticket. There was quite a bit of... For the governor's uh, race. For the governor's mm-hmm. race. You know, that's kind of your top of the ticket state race in Idaho. And that generated a lot of excitement uh, for, for the Democrats and, and brought some of them out and also brought a response from the Republicans that they got themselves organized and spent money. And, and so, you know, you, you saw a good turnout four years ago. You didn't see that this time because you you didn't have much effort or money being spent on the other side uh, of that equation. And so, uh, you know, we were on the low side, you know, over the last 30 years, you know, for these midterm general elections like this. It wasn't the lowest we've seen, but it was among the lowest. And what was the turnout for this state? What yeah, was it, the was, number? it was 56.8 percent is what we of registered voters in, of registered voters. Right. Okay. And the other thing that had happened four years ago that we should mention is that we had a major Medicaid expansion initiative on the ballot. And that also, I think, brought a, quite a bit of energy to that uh, election as well. It, that's true. And then, you know, this year we, we could have ended up with the same thing. We were going to have an initiative an on the ballot one. to spend a lot more money on education, to have a major increase in, in taxes, income taxes. Yeah. Uh, and, and that would have brought a lot of people out, too. But because of the special session of the legislature, uh, the proponents withdrew that uh, kind of at the last minute. And so it didn't end up on the ballot. Well, can I brag a little bit? Just yes, a little bit? do it. So Ada County Republicans turned out at 69.1 percent. And Ada County overall was what? About Ada a County point and a half. Over, I think it was 58.6. 58 and a half percent. Right. Yeah. So we were we were above the. Yeah. State average, and what, what, but our Republicans turned out ten and a half percent higher than the Democrats. So yeah, so thank Jay, you, Republicans, for coming out, and and thank you, Vic, and the leadership there in Ada County to get those those voters out. Well, everyone, our whole team. Well, I amazing. said Vic and the Republicans Volunteers. in Ada County. Everybody, Governors, everybody, everybody, yeah, okay. Uh, Jason, let's let's talk about some races that Vic and I were following um, in Lataw County, over there in Bannock County, in the Magic Valley, in District Twenty Six, in Ada County, District Fifteen. Talk about turnout in those and what if you what kind of trends maybe you saw in those counties, the highs and lows. Yeah, we saw a actually good turnout from Lataw County. Uh, they came in at 62.6%, so that's, you know, relatively well, significantly higher than the, the state average. And they did have that competitive uh, legislative state, race. State there. Senate race, yeah. Uh, yeah, for the, well, you know, all, all three of them were competitive, you know, the they had two representative yes. races there too. And so they were all competitive and I, I think that helped bring some people out. But, you know, again, you didn't necessarily see it super consistently. It was a little bit lower in Lewis County at 60%, which is in the same district. And then Nez Perce County is in that district too. And they were way down at 41.2%. Wow. Wow. Although it, it's a minority of Nez Perce County that's in district six. Let's talk specifically about 26 because, because of redistricting, 
we brought uh, Blaine County, which is traditionally, you know, a high voter turnout for Democrats, but combine them with Jerome and Lincoln, Lincoln County. So um, uh, Blaine County turnout versus Lincoln and Jerome County. Yeah. So Blaine County came in at 60.4%. And uh, Jerome County was at 52.7. Now, those are kind of the two population centers of the district. You've got Lincoln County in between. They were at 56.8, but there's not a lot of people who live there. You know, the two population centers are, you know, the Sun Valley area and and Jerome. So so it's safe to assume or maybe guess that if Jerome would have turned out at the same level as Blaine County, we may have had a different result in the two races that the Democrats won. Yeah, I think you almost certainly would have had a different result in that House 26A race. The, The Senate race had a little bit more spread between them. I don't know if it would have flipped that one or not. Certainly would have made it closer, though. Yeah. Great. Let, let, let's talk uh, about um, election integrity. And uh, Chad, Hoke, let, let's let's get you in here. Um, a lot of conversations over the past number of elections uh, about election integrity, um, and uh, a, a lot of states have uh, you know defended their efforts or explained their efforts. Right. Um, Idaho has actually been very proactive in not only claiming our elections are fair and accurate and 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 done in with 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 accurately and with integrity but we've taken steps to to assure that and demonstrate it so talk to us about that absolutely right there tom i mean we've over the last number of years both at the county level and at the state level made significant investments um, in technology in cybersecurity, in physical security in training all the way across the board, full spectrum, just really looking at the processes in how we handle elections. And uh, it's not that they were broken before, but there was some room for improvement. And we found where those spaces were, and we've gone out out and done audits in every county in terms of physical on-site visits to the county to help them understand maybe some improvements on where they're storing their ballots or how they're doing that, uh, what physical things that they can make improvements on in their in their office spaces to help improve the potential for or reducing fraud or reducing risk of anybody being able to tamper with something. Uh, so just a, a really broad stroke across the state of all the different investments that have been made. And it's turned out and been proven now more recently by these audits that we've been doing. Well, let's, let's talk about the audits and, and kind of the genesis of them. So, and then also, like the results, like are you happy? Are you yeah, pleased yeah, with, the with the uh, audience, yeah. absolutely. Know, what actually so happened? We've uh, for about three, four years now. We've been talking about. We were one of only about eight states in the country that did not have on the books a statutory post-election audit, and that was something Secretary Denny definitely wanted to address before his term was ended. Um, we've been working on it for. We tried two years for the legislation, and we're able to get that passed finally last legislative session. Uh, the legislation allows for a primary and general audit in even numbered years, so any of the statewide elections, and it brought along with it both the budget and the statutory authority to do so. What that looks like basically is we're going to go in on as the day after or the evening that all of the county canvases are brought in, when their results become official, when they get locked down. So how many days after election day is that? So it's seven to ten days, depending okay. on whether it's the general or the primary. And the in the primary, it's seven. In the general, it's ten. Uh, so they get a little bit more time on what's anticipated to be a slightly larger race. Um, but when they bring those results in, they get them into well, in this case, Jason's desk by five o'clock. Jason's compiling all the numbers and starting towards what becomes our state canvas. That's our state verification of those results. And the rest of the team immediately went down to the Lincoln Auditorium in the Capitol. And we held a lottery at that point. We started drawing by bingo balls the random, as soon as those numbers were locked, by we county. start drawing randomly by county. So 44, 44 counties. 44 balls. balls. Yep. We've got them broken up into, because we wanted it to be statistically right, relevant. You have larger counties, so medium we size, have our, small. We have our over 100,000. We have our medium, middle ground. And then okay. we have under 20,000 in terms of registered voters. We worked with Boise State University to actually okay. vet a viable statistical model sure. uh, through their mathematics department, through computer science with our insure program over there. Uh, we were able to put this whole piece together and came up with a way to do a random draw of eight counties that gives a statistical representation across the spectrum relative to the size of the counties. 
And in that, you've got a, an Ada County, Kootenai County, Canyon County group at the top, right. about 20 more in the middle, and then the remaining 20-some at the bottom. So you pull part. out these ping pong balls, and you pull end out up with eight balls. counties. What happens eight next? Counties. We then go in and randomly select within those counties what precincts we're going to look at to get us up to our confidence thresholds that we need in terms of the number of ballots that we're going to address. And then within the next 12 hours, we immediately go out and, and go after So you have those boots ballots. on the ground 12 hours later. And when's the first time the county knows that they've been selected? Uh, by the time we're drawing, they turn in their results at about 5 o'clock at night. In many cases, most of those counties just then immediately turn over custody of their ballots because they know we're going into a random draw. And if they're drawn, they're going to have to turn over custody. And those anyway. are turned over to the sheriff, right? Those are turned over to the sheriff's office. So they're in secure custody at that point. Mm-hmm. And we do the draw at about 7 o'clock at night. Uh, they're notified by about 8 o'clock. We don't even notify them necessarily of the precincts until we get there, and we're out at 8 o'clock the next morning. So within 12 hours, boots on the ground, and you're, uh, you're, you're going through the audit in these selected uh, counties and precincts. Exactly. So then we've got teams. We've got a, each team is, is constructed of a Republican representative appointee, a Democrat appointee, and one of our staff members, uh, in this case two of our staff members, the way we did it in the general, and those teams are out and in the counties at 8 o'clock the next morning. Uh, they're looking at ballots. They're pulling those random precincts. They are hand inspecting those ballots and counting that against the canvas. And then in this last one in the general, they're also looking at the ballot inventory controls. And where that's important is looking at and specifically diving into how many ballots were printed for that precinct, how many ballots were spoiled for that precinct. It's going after the reconciling and the math that goes into some the the analogy that somebody actually produced a fake ballot and got it in there. So how many ballots did you ultimately uh, audit, and how did that turn out? So in, about last, in the last cycle, we looked at just under 17,000 uh, individual ballots. In terms of the inventory control, we were able to reproduce all but one. Uh, so 16,999 out of 17,000. You're talking about six one-hundredths of a percent margin of error. Uh, with an anticipated margin of error when we went out of, we were looking for one-tenth of a percent. We found six one-hundredths. So you've, you've we, more we, than exceeded more a than very, exceeded very high standard. Itself, yeah. And it's a nice thing is when you don't have machine voting, right, you actually have a paper ballot and we're putting it right. through, right? And that's exactly it. I mean, the, the great that audit thing about all those huge. processes, we've always been paper. We never left paper. Uh, we hear that a lot because people moving in from other states are you know, making that argument. We need to get back to a paper ballot. Well, Idaho never left. Well, we're very grateful uh, for the service that you um, have to the state. Uh, We've been speaking with Chad Houck, who's the Chief Deputy Secretary of State, and Jason Hancock, the Deputy Secretary of State. And uh, we're grateful for your work, and we will see you next week on Keep Idaho Red Radio.